Well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. We'll see how many people will come online shortly. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Robin Morris. I'm the convener for the Oxford Energy Network. We connect energy researchers across the university. That actually makes a fantastic segue into the Energy Systems MSc because there's teaching delivered from not only engineering science, but chemistry, uh, material science, which is where I'm based, Department of Physics, and of course, School of Geography and the Environment as well. And we've long wondered how we can start plugging in some of the dissertation research topics from the Energy Systems MSc to promote that across the energy network and also start seeing what career path exists for people and then moving out into industry with all of the skills and knowledge they've gathered. So we're really, really pleased to have two excellent speakers this evening. And uh, one of them will be joining us remotely. The, the second speaker will be in person. But I was going to hand over to the course director, David Wallum, to tell us a little bit more about the MSc and, and, and to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Robin. Yes, um, so um, welcome everyone. So, uh, so as Robin said, so I'm the course director for the MSc in Energy Systems here within the University of Oxford, um, an interdisciplinary course that was built really to recognise the systems nature of the, the energy challenge that we face at the moment. We're based now within the Mini Tessa building over in Osney Mead as part of engineering's drive to build and the university's drive to to build the the face of energy research within the university we've just welcomed our fourth cohort of students um, to start the msc and it gives me great pleasure though to look back slightly at the second year cohort of which two of our speakers are here today but three other students from the msc at the same time as, as these two were able to present their work at the summer study meeting this summer in the south of France. So we were incredibly pleased to get five of our dissertation research dissertations actually published in an international conference of such repute. And so from that point of view, it was clear to everyone the standing that the MSc is starting to build. So the first of our speakers today, um, Eflam Guggen, um, who is now a consultant at NG, but as you will see in his presentation and that you can see on his presentation's title slide, that he did his dissertation actually in partnership with a competitor, <laughs> so with Viola. Um, and so, yes, so I'm going to hand over to Aflan um, now, who's going to be talking about renewable microgrids covering the heat and electricity needs of industrial parks. So over to you, Aflan. Um, thank you very much, David, and uh, thank you very much for um, for everyone. I can't see you, um, unfortunately, but thank you very much for being present today. Um, so, as David explained, I'm going to talk about so renewable microgrids covering the heat and electricity needs of industrial parks. Um, but before that, I will um, maybe quickly talk about uh, myself and also about uh, my uh, education and also how I was interested about like energy decentralization and more importantly about microgrids. So um, as David said, so I graduated from Oxford in 2021, so one year ago, and I'm now we're working as an energy consultant at uh, NG, where I work on a different type of missions, um, more some more technical and others, but that are linked to um really making sure that um, ng is moving towards a more um, sustainable and um, a company and also um, making ng a company that is uh, really answering to the issues of the current uh, energy systems uh, transformation and uh, before that i had um, both an engineer and also a financial background and uh, I've been interested with uh, energy decentralization for some years now. It started in Singapore where I worked on um, so the development of um, microgrids in developing countries and more importantly in Myanmar and Indonesia. And then I did I wrote a first master thesis around uh, microgrids, but more on how to create portfolios of um, microgrids to uh, attract uh, investors and reduce the risk. 
So I did my final uh, master thesis that was uh, published during the ECEE um, so summit. Uh, so this uh, it was yes in June this year uh, around so renewable microgrids covering heat and electricity needs of industrial parks. And before starting, I will really want to thank um, David for this uh, opportunity. Uh, it gave, he gave us and to me and to all the students the um, opportunity to really um, put light on the work that we've done uh, during the, our master thesis and to be able also to present our work to really uh, to specialists. So thanks again. And I will also want to thank Anne for today for organizing this um, energy seminar. Um, so now that I've talked a bit about myself and uh, shown you how um, I was interested in energy decentralization, I was my motivation on working on this topic is uh, so I there is uh, nowadays like a niche, you like an energy trilemma for the industrial sector. So first of all, there is like a need to be more sustainable. Um, there are more and more um, expectations around industries to make sure to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I am currently working in the Star Energy, so Star Energy, which is an entity of uh, Engie specialized in uh, natural gas, uh, so in natural gas storage, and we are working around how to really reduce our carbon uh, footprint. Uh, during our activities. Um, then they are in the LNG trilemma. There are two points that are maybe more and more um, important now in the center also of uh, the current topic based on the geopolitical um, tensions that we have with the war in Ukraine. So the question of affordability, but also um, on the visibility of uh, the electricity prices, we are going towards a world, a world that may be more and more um, like energy markets that may be more and more volatile. And then uh, the second, the third point is the security of supply. We've seen it uh, with natural gas for Europe, with uh, Ukraine, but um, I'll go a bit further than just like the geopolitical tensions. I believe that a uh, threat to our energy system is also the current transformation that we see due to climate change. Um, here on this picture, we, you can see like the fires that we had in uh, California um, two years ago, and that really impacted the industrial sector in California uh, due to uh, power outages that uh, happened due to the fires. Um, so the idea was uh, to think: Is there like are like renewable microgrids uh, an answer to the to this energy trilemma? Is it possible to um, really if uh, Industry, industries have their own um, energy generation assets on site. Is it uh, really a solution in terms of sustainability, affordability and security of supply? That was our question. And so the objective of this study was to um, create a methodology to assess so the techno economic and financial feasibility of renewable heat and power microgrids for industrial parks. And it was done in partnership with um, Veolia. So French company that is uh, tackling uh, these um, industrial um, uh, industrial decarbonization and affordability and security of supply issues. So, and I also want to thank them, especially because they gave us some um, real case data that enabled us to test our methodology. So, here a quick agenda to um, for today's uh, speech. Um, so first I will talk about so the methodology that we have used and developed to tackle here uh, this question. Um, then we'll see how we tested this methodology on the real case study. So it was uh, here UK industri uh, industrial park in, in the UK um, that was specialized in food and beverage. And um, then we'll present the different results in terms of sizing, but also in terms of the resiliency of the solution and costing. And uh, more importantly, talk about what could be the improvements. And in the conclusion and discussion, I will um, like to um, introduce maybe what could be like the next steps of such projects. And I will 
uh, maybe um, yes um, need your advice on some points on um, the idea that I may have on how it may uh, move forward. So uh, yeah, that will be uh, that will be the agenda for today. So first of all, um, the idea was to uh, really design a renewable microgrid that was able to meet uh, both the heat and electricity de demand of the industrial park. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure, because both of them are two energy vectors that are uh, key to the industrial activities. Therefore, um, here, so the technology that we will develop is um, a microgrid that is based on PV panel and uh, storage, so lithium ion um, batteries, and also uh, biogas uh, CHP uh, turbine. So here, so the CCHP is, uh, you have a part that will be uh, also, um, that will uh, bring electricity to uh, the to meet the electric uh, load, but also some uh, heat part. So here the microgrid will be both working on electricity and heat. And here also something that is quite important is that uh, we have uh, our electricity, our um, microgrid will not work in uh, off-grid mode. Um, the idea is not to make sure to have like 100, only 100% 100 of uh, the energy that is uh, supplied by the microgrid, but we want to have some uh, interaction with the grids, but both uh, for um, like um, security of supply issue, but also for a financial issue because they can have like some um, a trading. We wanted to have like some kind of a trading behavior with our microgrid that will enable like to uh, sell electricity on the market at uh, some convenient times. So this is the solution that we uh, want to design. And to do so, we have a three-step methodology. So first step is really to try to really understand the demand of the industrial park and also be able to even like model the demand of an industrial park. So for this, we design like a first tool, so a demand analysis tool that have like two different uh, operation modes. The first one is that if it's an industrial park with already established um, electricity, heat and cooling demand on uh, like uh, daily data and or hourly data uh, spread around like a year. And then we just have like some analysis. So it gave us like the um, like all the different uh, load patterns on a daily and seasonal basis. And we also have like a second part of this tool that is um, we are able like to model um, an industrial park by combining different um, energy loads of uh, different uh, companies. For example, sometimes in an industrial park, you may have um, small companies that are um, working together on the same site or some small industries. And therefore, we were also able to um, create like a fictive industrial by, uh, park thanks to this, uh, to this tool. Um, then, uh, so the output is so an industrial park demand pattern. And uh, so after this, we have uh, our microgrid optimal sizing tool um, that is uh, able to uh, size the micro, uh, so size the technology based on the demand, but uh, also based on the resource that we have there. So meteorological data, but also some techno economic data that we integrate uh, here. So the prices of the different uh, technologies uh, in terms of CAPEX, but also in terms of OPEX. And uh, we also integrate uh, like the um, G, uh, like the greenhouse gases. Um, uh, so the carbon footprint of it, each technology to make sure to integrate all this uh, element into our um, optimization uh, model um, to make sure that we have the most um, cost effective and also uh, more sustainable solution as possible. And then um, because we were working with, um, with a company, we wanted to give them some financial um, inputs and therefore we developed like a financial model uh, based on the fact that uh, we considered here that our microgrid will be like a, a, 
uh, SPV, where we will have we will finance it with some debt and equity ratios, and um, at the end we'll work on the twenty year period, for example, on on our we will operate this uh, this micro in twenty year period, and it enable us like to have some financial um, elements that were provided to uh, the partner at the time. Um, so here, uh, the, now we tested this methodology on a real case study in the UK industrial park. So here, the UK um, industrial park, we didn't have any idea where it was located, but um, we decided to locate it in Oxford because we had access to meteorological and also to pricing uh, data. Um, then it's an industrial park specialized in food and beverage, and especially in you had, for example, some uh, packaging um, areas, you had some uh, food pro uh, meat production uh, areas and packaging areas, some pasteurization, and um, it's a really big uh, company as it represents, uh, or industrial park as it represents. Uh, uh, almost uh, 200,000 uh, square meters on which you had uh, 90, almost 90 percent that was a production area. Um, so you had uh, three energy vectors, you had the electricity, the heat and the cooling. For the heat part you had a steam part and also uh, uh, LT, uh, HW, uh, WH um, part, um, so more uh, heating part. Um, so, in terms of energy consumption, the average early capacity was 21 uh, megawatts, and also the average daily consumption was uh, around like 515 megawatt hours, on which, uh, let's say, 45% was electricity, 45% was heat, and the rest was, uh, so 10% was uh, cooling. And so, you had a total yearly consumption of 188 gigawatt hours. Um, you can see you also had some uh, variation in terms of uh, seasonality here, especially on the heating part. Uh, so you could see that you had less uh, heat during, uh, especially during the summer. That was due to less heating uh, in the warehouses, but also due to uh, a reduction of some uh, economic activity during this month. And finally, uh, we computed so the carbon intensity of our solution, and that was around the 258 gram of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. So how we computed this? Uh, we computed the electricity part uh, based on the carbon footprint of the UK network. And also for the heat and cooling part, we considered that it was, um, because it was like this at the time, uh, provided by natural gas. So therefore, it enabled us like, to have the carbon intensity of our industrial park. And um, so after this, so the result is we sized so a microgrid. Uh, here it's more mega than micro due to uh, the size of the industrial park. Um, because we have so solar PV of 23 megawatt um, batteries of 20, the battery capacity of 25 megawatt hours, a CHP of almost 15 megawatt uh, capacity and a cooler of 3.6. Um, here, the result of this solution is that it was resilient uh, because uh, it worked uh, most of the time, the industrial park energy was coming from the microgrid. So you had 95% uh, of the electricity that was uh, of the energy that was based on the microgrid, and only 10.2% of the electricity that was imported from the grid. In terms of carbon reduction, we had 62% reduction in gre greenhouse gases emission um, due to the fact that uh, we reach. Uh, this is, was mainly due to the fact that we use only renewable technologies. And um, we had also a reduction of, so these values of 97 gram of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour was 30% uh, lower than the technology that was uh, proposed by the, part, the industrial partner at the time, so by Veolia. So in terms of uh, resiliency and uh, carbon intensity, it was really an improvement. Uh, more on the financial level now, we had a capex of uh, 65 uh, million US dollars. Um, everything was computed in dollars because our projects were all 
we had also other industrial parks and some were uh, in the US or in Europe or in the UK. Um, the OPEX was of uh, 6 million per year at the time. Um, here, so two things. The first thing is that in terms of costing, uh, we didn't have access to really uh, prices, um, to really uh, precise prices. So we had an, a project that was uh, really profitable, uh, but with an LCOE that was quite low, around 80, um, 80 US dollars per uh, megawatt hour, that was uh, lower than, let's say, from what was expecting by the partner, like uh, two to three times lower from what we were expecting. And it was mainly due to our hypothesis in the terms of uh, the costing of the biogas. And, and so here some improvement may be done, but we had um, a technology that was uh, financially uh, profitable. Um, now, in terms of resiliency, I wanted to show you also how it operates on the electricity part, because we really wanted like to test the resiliency of this technology um, in different uh, scenarios. So first of all, we took like the critical day uh, in our data set. So the day where really the electricity, the difference between like the electricity that was generated by the CHP and uh, read the electricity generated by the PV, gen by the PV, as you can see in blue here on, on the graph on the left, uh, was the highest. So at the time where really the microgrid will be um, the most stressed. And uh, you can see here that uh, in this scenario, the microgrid use, uses like the, the, the grid as it imports like some electricity in the grid, as you can see uh, in, in black. Um, however, on the graph on the left, so it's uh, more on a seasonal here, average seasonal uh, operation on, in autumn. So you can see that in normal case scenario, so the microgrid is also able to have some trading and uh, some, yeah, some trading um, behavior, or at least to uh, store the electricity, as you can see in here in uh, for example, in, in gray. So the microgrid is able to store the excess electricity that is generated by uh, the solar uh, during until uh, 3 p.m. And after this, uh, you can see in orange, it's uh, selling it during uh, the afternoon at the time where the electricity prices are the highest. So um, there, there is some uh, here, some uh, cost efficient um, behavior with the microgrid that could be improved because here the peak in prices are more around like uh, 6 and 7 uh, p.m. than uh, 4 or 5 p.m. Um, finally, some improvement that can be done is so the microgrid sizing could have been improved, especially on the CHP part because the CHP part was based only on the uh, heating uh, on the heating demand. So we wanted to make sure that we had 100% of our heat that was provided by the CHP. Uh, therefore, it induces some um, uh, oversizing in a way because our uh, CHP was only working at 65% of its capacity on in average. So for this, uh, it could have been interesting to have some heat storage also included in the model. However, it was um, in the for three uh, months work a bit uh, difficult to integrate. Um, something also that could have been improved is the coding to reduce like the computation time, especially in the um, sizing uh, of the microgrid. And uh, in terms of profitability, the high profitability ratios can be explained due to uh, so the fact that we didn't uh, use like the most adequate uh, pricing in terms uh, for the biogas part. And also, um, we should have taken into account more uh, so higher risk for the biogas supply chain. Um, has uh, it is um, for now uh, still a really expensive um, like supply chain to develop and also some risky activity that may um, worsen our um, financing um, for our project.
Um, so in conclusion, we had with this methodology, we were able really to develop a microgrid that was um, uh, really answering and the need, the heat, the heating and the cooling and the electricity needs of an industrial parks. And uh, the idea here is um, what, how could we use this methodology and what can be done maybe to uh, go a bit further. And um, here there is like a, a free, uh, let's say a free step um, idea. The first one here is really to focus on uh, what could be like the most promising size and the most promising type of industrial parks in terms of um, electricity and heat demand uh, that may um, fit this type of technologies or integrated technologies. And for this, we may need like to study different types of industrial parks and also different types of sizes or different um, percentage of energy consumption that is covered by the microgrid to really find like the best um, like solution in terms of resiliency, uh, economic feasibility and also uh, carbon intensity. And then, so based on the different sizes, we can also then uh, find a real industrial park that will meet, uh, so the different conditions that we may have found. And uh, finally, uh, a pilot project could also be launched based on the industrial park that we have uh, found, and then like try to develop a first integrated technology to answer uh, these uh, questions and oh, the, the needs of the industrial parks and to have some feedback and experience to like be able to develop all the types of project for um, like really the type of industries that we may have uh, uh, yes identified in the first in the first phase. Um, thank you very much uh, for um, uh, hearing me and I'm really available for any questions or thoughts that you have. Thank you very much. OK, um, any questions? Um, any from our online audience as well? Um, so I'm going to ask the question. OK, Robert, uh, you, uh, you would you like to come up. Yeah, as well. I'll come over and speak to you, but I just wonder if you examined coupling of the heating and cooling, were there any efficiency gains to actually pull some of the output from the cooling system into the heat store? You said there wasn't a heat store there now, but were there some cross coupling benefits that you could investigate between the heating and the cooling? Uh, no, we didn't investigate like really the gains in terms of heating and cooling. Um, no, we we didn't actually uh, stu study this part, and we didn't study also like the the part on the on the storage for heating or above cooling. Okay, you you mentioned of course about the comparison with the um, with the viola solution, um, and and of course then the sort of the the differences. Uh, was it was it solely around um, that just in some ways that sort of needs to have more accuracy around the biogas or or do you think also that, that we we'd, we'd hit there been a, a better methodology for understanding demand really from your solution? Um, I think yes, understanding demand is is key because um, here like we focused maybe on the electricity part and the fact to make sure to answer um, at 100 percent or to add the most electricity as possible but for the heating and cooling part um, we did not really study the variation because we decided to have a technology that was uh, really answering 100 percent of the heat and here, for example, for Veolia, their solution, I can tell what solution they used but or they developed, but what they uh, used is, was not answering 100% or covering 100% of the demand, first of all. 
and uh, that was really it was mostly working on heat the heating parts and so they i believe that they understood and worked more on understanding the needs for um, or the demand for the heating parts and just quickly check for that. yes you want to speak yep yeah, speak speak loud later on. okay um thanks again for the talk um, you mentioned about the battery storage of 25 megawatt hours and potentially trying to release that energy from the batteries. <laughs> He's coming to the front. You can. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Gilgeen. You had the 25 megawatt hour battery storage. Um, just interested to know if you were going to release that, say, between six and seven to get the peak rates. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea of the time? gap you could actually say if you wanted to get rid of all the 25 megawatt capacity megawatt hour capacity could you do that within an hour or was there a time sort of frame on how quickly you can release that the the the, the energy back into the to the grid yeah what we what we the apoth the hypothesis that we took is that we could do it in like one hour like quite quite quickly so that may also explain like uh, we took a one hour delay, so here, yeah, you can maybe shift it like from from one hour to 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 make sure, like, yes, it's really delivered from the grid. So, yeah, it was okay. one hour we took into consideration. Okay, um, and a final question from me, actually, about so less less about your project, but more about the MSC and and the preparedness for yeah. your new position, of course. You know, apart from the the academic side of the MSc, do you you know could you say a little about whether you know how you found that the course prepared you for your your position within within NG and what's really demanded of you as a consultant there? Yeah, so um, actually uh, great, and I haven't been paid for to tell this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's just like um, really what the MSc uh, gave us is that a view on oh, to make sure to always try to take a step back and look at the energy system on in overall and to make sure to try to understand what are the um, different uh, benefit from a technology or from a type of project or a strategic orientation. And so um, Nowadays, for example, I'm uh, working around um, in the uh, natural gas storage, but um, also this division is working on how to integrate, so how to develop um, so biogas uh, on a project. So uh, here there is also the question that at what size uh, we want to develop, how we want to develop it and all this, and also what answer we can give to or what question we can tackle within the energy system and then there is also uh, uh, yeah and there is also all this question on like the current uh, technology or storage technology that we have within uh, storage and how we make them evolve to make sure that we uh, store um, so uh, green gases in the future and what the MSC uh, enabled me is really to make sure that we think about all the different components of the energy system and we always try to think not only on the current operating time but also in really in the transformation of the energy system within like in 10 years, 15 years or 30 years. So this was great. And uh, the final thing is that this uh, master thesis, I still want to continue and to push the project and or idea, the idea of integrated solution developed for industrial um, uh, industrial parks or, or industries. And um, so, yeah, my idea is also to try what enabled me or um, something that we also had to do within the MSC is try to uh, look for solutions and push the solutions and I'm currently doing it within my within the company so it's something that the MSC enabled me to do. Great thank you very much Eflam so thank you very much. Thank you.
Right. OK, so that was the first of our two speakers um, today. Uh, if you want to minim, uh, in a sh sh right, if you stop sharing your screen, Aflam, we will share. Uh, there we go. You should now see. Um, now, so we're over to our second speaker. Um, now, one of the key things within the MSC, of course, is around is within the station is getting different members of the energy network to supervise students. And as part of the project that uh, that Zishua um, undertook, uh, supervised by Masao Ashdeen and Scott Wheeler, who were both part of the Local Energy Oxfordshire project. So this enabled our students to connect into cutting edge research that was being done within the university and then also have a view to how they can contribute back into the projects themselves. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Z up here, um, who's now moved on himself um, to Aurora Consulting, um, physically based here in Oxford. Yep. So thank you very much, Z. Yep. Thanks, Professor David. Um, Yep, cool. So, um, hi all, I'm Z. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Oxford Energy Network for organizing this seminar and for Professor David Wallum um, um, to speak in it. So today I'll be talking about my um, master's dissertation um, for the MSc. Um, so it's with regards to like um, heterogeneity in the um, EV and V2G markets um, in the UK. So as mentioned, I was um, supervised by the amazing um, Dr. Masao Ashton and also um, I have many, a lot of contribution by Dr. Scott Wheeler. So let's get started. Um, over here, uh, we see the domestic um, greenhouse gas emissions um, by the UK um, in 2019. So this slide outdated, but it paints um, a very pertinent picture that um, transport contributes to most of the emissions uh, in the country. So it is therefore very important um, that uh, we focus on um, transport decarbonization for our net zero um, ambition. So recognizing this, um, there are many countries and regions who have already um, set up their, in, uh, aside from their net zero pledge, has set up like um, uh, transport um, goals. So for example, on the left, uh, top left over here, you see in all the yellow, uh, all the goals for like um, zero emissions vehicle sales, zero emissions vehicle stock by different countries. And on the right, you see like um, the net zero pledge. So what this um, shows me is that um, this, these goals are very, very ambitious and most likely would require like um, in massive amount of public intervention. And again, a transition of this scale and this speed will require um, policies that are very cost effective and also um, equitable uh, in order to garner like, popular support. So um, over here, I've listed some of the typical um, instruments that have been used to um, uh, promote electric, electric vehicle like adoptions um, in the world. So you have the typical financial incentives, um, the mandates and standards, as well as indirect incentives um, that are available. And the colors represent the target audience for each of the policy. So in blue, you have the consumers, red are the manufacturers, and yellow, you have system-wide policies. So what um, uh, system-wide targets, such as like a bans on conventional vehicles are very important. We also require like a supplementary policies that target like um, specific consumer group that are pertinent in each stage of the transition um, in order to have like a, a more a smaller transition. So to understand these um, behaviors within the, um, uh, the vehicle market, um, I utilize um, innovation diffusion theory um, to study like a drivers behind vehicle purchase um, in the UK. I then um, recommended specific policies as well as like apply those policies in the, into a timeline. So first of all, um, what is innovation diffusion theory? So it's first proposed like, uh, by Everett Rogers in 1962, so it's quite old. Um, it breaks technology adoption down to five different categories um, with um, the indicative market sizes of each category as well as their um, attitudes towards um, technology adoption. So the five categories are the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, as well as the laggards. So IDT allows um, a bottom-up view of the, from the consumer's point of view. So it highlights different aspects behind like a, a adoption of a technology from scarcity driven to uh, more practical things like uh, financial considerations. So the theory also aligns um, with the macroscopic view of um, the S curve, which you see in yellow over here, um, from most technology adoption that you can see from a macro macroscopic point of view. So I would quickly go through um, what each of the categories are. Um, so first of all, are the innovators. So these guys are the early adopters of technology. So they are motivated by the scarcity of the technology. 
um, innovators seek to differentiate themselves um, through um, uh, through the technology adoptions and are typically insensitive to price signals because of their high financial status. So these groups are willing to take risks with technology uh, simply to like um, seek novelty as well as to, um, to achieve higher perceived social status. Next are the early adopters. So these groups seek to convert new technology to their advantage. They're also termed like lighthouse customers um, because they form like a very synergistic bonds with the manufacturers and guide the development of a new product. So the penetration of a new product into this uh, category is very important because um, it then helps um, the maturing process of, of uh, technology. Um, yeah. So next would be the early majority. Um, they are a very large part of the market and well, they are very different from the previous two groups. This group of people, they are more concerned about pragmatic um, uh, uh, concerns, such as like cost and utility of a product. And if you successfully penetrate into this um, category is uh, an achievement of um, um, critical mass for the, your products. Next are the late majority. So along with the early majority, they form like, like a large part, uh, the largest part of the market. So the late majority is special because they are not really like a, incentivized by anything in particular, but by social proofing of a, by the preceding segments. So this means that um, they want to look at the tech and it works well for people before adopting it themselves. So this typically takes time. And also um, due to the typically low um, financial liquidity of this group, um, equitable policies would be very important in the um, EV transition um, for this group. And finally are the legates. So they are the conservative who are typically skeptical of change. So in the context of um, personal vehicles, this could be a general aversion to change or maybe like um, uh, tied to like a behavioral lock-in tied to conventional vehicles. So in order to guide this um, group through the transition, um, top-down mandates uh, a bit more, uh, slightly more required, such as like um, um, conventional vehicle bans or tailpipe emission ban. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we apply um, IDT to study um, uh, to the UK market. So first of all, we break down the market into different phases and we define the phase by the market share of EV sales. So for example, if a market has 10% um, of EV sales, we can say that the market is in an early adopters phase. What this means is that um, within a group of vehicle buyers, 10% um, of them would make up of innovators and early adopters who would be choosing EVs um, for purchasing their vehicles, whereas the rest of the uh, consumer group would be choosing like conventional fossil fuel vehicles. So this means that um, um, only innovators and um, consumers are purchasing EV. And by that, we can infer um, the, dominant, the dominant consumer group and also the drivers behind the uh, purchase of EVs at any point in time um, within the uh, EV transition. So another example that I have over here, so this graph shows like a market share um, of EV sales in different regions in 2020. So it's a bit uh, messy, um, but I'll try to get through it. So you have like um, regions other than um, Europe and China that are lower and at around 2% of uh, market share by 20, 2020. So by our de definition, this means that their um, transition is at the innovator phase. So in order to promote EVs, uh, the governments of this region, what they can do is actually to target innovators um, at this point in time. So this means that um, the innovators are not very sensitive to financial uh, incentive, and therefore what they can do is to allow like things that are privileged. So for example, um, bus lane access or access to um, low emission zones within um, the city, or even like unique schemes uh, have seen to, are seen to be working, such as like uh, granting um, unique license splits um, for EVs. So this allows innovators to set themselves aside, and this actually promotes uh, EVs um, when during this stage of the transition. Um, Norway, for example, on the other hand, has like 70% um, of EV market share, and by our definition, is in the late majority phase of um, their transition. So um, Norway actually, um, as like um, it's very common, like the final stage of a change is typically very difficult. So they re may require like a more heavy handed approach, such as again, like bans on um, conventional vehicles. So while this may be actually like, politically unpopular, in it could actually fall within the overturning window for Norway because EV is mainstream over there. So as a corollary as well, um, IDT also informs when policies could be stopped. So again, with Norway, um, since the vast majority of the EV buyers now um, do not appreciate, like um, do not require um, um, access to bath links, the policy could be stopped um, as well as like um, to save costs. So now I'll go further um, and talk about the UK in particular. So before we start, I'd like to say that IDT is a very, very useful tool because it's easily integrated with like uh, existing uh, industrial studies. 
So this over here is the um, um, Deloitte Insights uh, reports into EV markets in 2020. Uh, that's what we use for our study. So the um, they actually interviewed um, about 1,500 participants uh, of vehicle buyers and break down the vehicle um, uh, markets in the UK into nine different segments. And they show the connections of different segments to um, the consumer profiles, so their ages, whether they are vehicle owners or not, as well as patterns, so whether they work, they use their worker for work or for personal use and so on. And so they tie those um, together into a consumer segment. And then more crucially, they provide like the market sizes of each of the consumers uh, segment, as well as their likelihood of purchasing an EV. So using this data, then um, match this to IDT. And how we do that is first we um, integrate, or oh, sorry, we rank the consumer segments by their EV purchase likelihood, right? So we got consumer G who are, uh, segment G who are more uh, interested in uh, EV purchase. And then we match this to IDT through the segment size of the consumer segment. So now we get um, a further information. We know that um, segment G, for example, would be the innovators in the UK. Segment C are early adopters. BD and H would be early majorities and so on. So with this, what we do with it is that we have um, a clearer view of what um, the drivers of uh, EV purchase are behind each stage of the transition in the UK. So aside from what we know already from IDT, we now have added information from um, the Deloitte reports. So for example, from the Deloitte report, we know that um, the segment G or the innovators are brand loyal. Um, on the other hand, um, the early adopters, um, they usually travel long distance and therefore they will be more um, uh, uh, interested in EV due to the fuel cost savings and so on. So now that we have a closer view or a more fuller view of the um, consumer um, in the UK, we came up with a few um, policy teams that are uh, um, for, to, for to guide the transition. So within the innovator phase, um, again, uh, this is quite popular in Norway as well to allowing um, the the owners, EV owners, road access, as well as like, access into like low emission zones. Uh, this could work very well. And also, since they are more likely to possess um, home parkings, uh, off-street parking, home charging grants would work um, uh, in this case. So for the early adopters, um, I'm sorry about the, uh, the off, uh, <laughs> the, some of the, 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 the formatting. Um, for the early adopters, um, street charging um, installations would work very well for them, um, as well as like a financial incentives, so things like purchase subsidies. The early majority, however, um, are more guided by um, used market regulation because they are actually consumers um, uh, and are typically more interested in purchasing secondhand vehicles. I'll go into more in depth um, in my next section about the used markets. Um, for the late majority, since they are more persuaded by um, social proofing, they are actually guided by the same amount of same set of, of incentives as early majority. And finally, for the laggards, um, they will be um, required. We require more um, um, fossil or more uh, top down mandates such as. Um, um, conventional vehicle vans as well as tailpipe emission vans um, in order to, to, to complete the transition. So um, throughout the study, we find that actually corporate schemes are actually quite important in the UK context. Um, that's because, first of all, the high actually uh, would, would actually dissuade or, or, or push away like um, retail purchases. So fleet purchases are now very important because like um, by all these logistics and transport company, simply because like uh, they could accelerate the social proofing of EVs, right? They can be seen to work. And also um, in the UK, um, corporations typically on average um, upgrade their fleet once every three years. So this could actually um, promote the flow of EVs into the secondhand market as well. So now that we have um, our rough policy um, teams, I now serve, I'm now try to actually apply them into a timeline so over here, uh, we have a very ambitious timeline that's by um, the UK uh, National Grid FES scenario, uh, their most ambitious scenario, by the way. So I first split the, the growth into five um, uh, different uh, phases, as um, what I mentioned earlier. So we have like the innovator phase up to the legged phase of the EV um, penetration in the UK. And then I apply um, the policies that I mentioned earlier into each of these phases, um, in each of these uh, different phases. So what we have over here is that we have a set of policies that we know when to start and when um, to end um, in order to guide EV um, transition um, to support the net zero ambition in the UK. So that's one of the results. Next, I'll make uh, a quick segue into the use markets. So the use markets is very important because um, um, of a high demand um, 
typically high demand in most regions, I think. So in the UK itself, like 77% of um, vehicle sales in 2019 are actually um, secondhand. So it's massive and also it's on the upward trajectory. Um, also furthermore, um, EV with the up, high upfront cost would likely um, push um, buyers into the secondhand market as well, more buyers in the secondhand market. So we foresee that the um, secondhand market is very important, but however, um, the secondhand market faces a couple of problems. So first of all, with EV being new, there we foresee a supply um, issue with EVs, right? So from the lens of IDT, the innovator, innovators group and as well as the early adopters group make up like about 16% of the entire market. And the early majority groups who are more, um, uh, who have interest to buy secondhand vehicles are actually in a range of 34%. So there simply just isn't enough like a vehicles to flow into the secondhand market, right? So we might actually require like a more targeted um, policies to encourage people to resell their vehicles. So this could be like splitting up the current subsidy schemes into two different parts. One when you purchase um, a vehicle, another way is when we resell a vehicle um, into the secondhand markets. Um, that would actually um, encourage um, uh, resale. And uh, the issue is with um, battery degradation. So most of the value of EVs is tied to uh, these batteries. So that means that typically EVs um, experience degradation or depreciation faster than its um, conventional counterparts. So what this means is that um, EVs to, be, to want to resell uh, the EVs into the market. And from the buyer's point of view, um, it's uh, something that we've heard a lot for EVs, so it's range anxiety, and it's even more pronounced in the second-hand market. So what we suggest over here is that um, we could actually come up with like a battery certification scheme that's being managed by a collaboration between like a government agency or private agency, as well as like a vehicle man manufacturers and battery man uh, manufacturers to come up with a certification scheme to actually um, verify the state of health of the batteries for EVs in the second-hand market. This would actually um, boost confidence in the market and actually um, allow um, uh, more, more confidence in the second-hand markets. So finally, in addition to all of this uh, I mentioned earlier, um, what can actually boost the um, flow of EVs in the second-hand market is actually um, innovations within EVs itself. So we could actually re-engage the innovators and early adopters to um, get into um, uh, 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 a new market such as a V2G. And then uh, they will actually upgrade their vehicles and uh, encourage flow. So um, V2G, um, uh, for those who are uh, not familiar with it, stands for vehicle to grid. It's a concept. Um, that is typically um, allows bike directional charging for um, uh, vehicle batteries. So this allows like, vehicle owners to actually engage in um, grid and service, ancillary services as well as um, arbitrage. From a system point of view, it actually allows a more efficient configuration of the energy systems because it allows deferment of network, uh, investment of network into the network and assets. Um, from the buyer's point of view, it also like um, the revenue stacking also allows um, buyers to actually um, see a lower price for their EVs and higher return. So, however, for my presentation's uh, purposes, it's actually just an innovation that actually um, um, could serve to re-engage um, the first uh, couple of categories of consumers in order for them to upgrade their vehicles for V2G. Um, V2G, however, faces a couple of problems. So, um, uh, publication, we see that actually they anticipate V2G to actually um, experience uh, market cannibalizations into their revenue at about 20% of the EV fleets. So what this means is that we actually do not need uh, V2G to achieve a mass, mass market status, but simply to be diffused into the um, innovators and early adopters uh, category. So luckily, we have our from our results earlier, we know that the innovators and to a certain extent, um, the um, early adopters, they are very loyal. So in order to promote V2G, what we need is actually to find these people. So the Center of Automotive Management in Germany in 2021, um, they published a list of um, vehicle brands and how innovative they are. Um, so shown here uh, in this table would be um, the vehicle brands with um, presence in the UK. So we hypothesize that actually um, the vehicle brands and their status uh, actually reflects the consumer categories of their own customers. So for example, Tesla customers may be in the innovator space or more generally and maybe in the innovators. So they demand innovations from um, Tesla, and that's why Tesla is where it is right now. Uh, meanwhile, um, Nissan, for example, um, the consumers would be um, more focused on the fundamentals um, of a vehicle, right? So functionalities and so on. So they don't demand as much innovation, uh, which is why uh, we see Nissan on the legacy. Um, this could actually serve to um, uh, explain why 
um, while Nissan is one of two brands with um, commercially available V2G um, uh, vehicle or model in Japan, it's actually not very popular with, with its customer base because the customer base um, are not that uh, adventurous with technology. So knowing this, um, what the UK government can do is actually it can actually target um, these brands which uh, have commercial prospects of V2G in the UK and hence uh, are more willing to invest into the projects. And therefore, um, we can actually allocate funds into uh, collaborating with um, these uh, brands and therefore and conduct like, large scale feasibility studies and feasibility projects uh, with uh, these, these brands. So um, finally, to summarize, um, uh, I have three main points over here. So first of all, um, IDT is as a very useful tool. It provides like a bottom-up and consumer-centric view into the vehicle markets. And more, more, um, more, moreover, it's also a very flexible tool and you can use it to collate with various market studies that are available in the industry. And the second point is that uh, for EVs um, uh, development in the UK, uh, it's, it's very important to target the corporates as well as uh, the used vehicle markets and have like a more uh, policy surrounding these areas. And finally, for V2G in the UK, uh, it's all about targeting the right customers and the right brand. So um, to close, um, I believe that the uh, EV transition uh, in the UK um, could be approached from more from a marketing point of view. Um, and to do that, customers are and what they want. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, any questions for our speaker? Go on, Robert. Well, I'm kind of blown away because I, sure. I've had indirect involvement in V2G demonstrations right. with what we consider to be the most advanced technology company. But what you're saying is that counts very little compared with the position of the company and its customer base. Correct. Yes, because um, from my point of view is that um, in order for V2G to advance, we actually require like a lot of demand for the technology. And based on uh, our study, it seems that um, the easiest way, I'm not saying that uh, you can't do it, but the, the way with this friction and this inertia is to actually target brands that are the cup where their consumers actually want V2G and therefore would actually like uh, accelerate the process. Yeah, it's very interesting. Nissan at the moment is actually the only <laughs> mainstream brand which is a really interesting point. Yes, and it's not very popular well, due to various issues, um, charging uh, standards and so on, but I, I think one of the um, our, our findings is that it's due to because their customers just don't need it. Yeah. And as a supplementary, I mean, a standard vehicle charging point is being engineered down to a low cost to make it attractive to the market. Right. But the V2G charger, which is yeah. quite substantially more expensive, exactly. that sounds like that's not a barrier to the people who are an innovator because they're quite excited to engage exactly. in a new space and maybe the, the cost of that is not the, the significant determining factor. Yes. That's absolutely right. So they are the ones who are less um, um, price um, sensitive. So yeah, they'll be actually more invested. In a sense, it's kind of like similar to other products as well, where um, while you may have like a higher barrier to entry, but you actually have like more savings in the long run. And this is actually an opportunity that's open to a select few. So, I mean, I wouldn't say much about that. Really not. But at the same time, in order to like, um, to move our, our, if we want to have V2G in our systems uh, in the UK, then that's, I think, the way to go forward. You mentioned about um, policies actually to encourage the used vehicle market. Yep. Now, of course, bearing in mind the large quantity of embodied energy within the electric vehicle, Volvo, for example, said that Basically, they don't break even with uh, a European standard of electricity to 80,000 kilometers. Right. Encouraging people to continue with the very rapid vehicle turnover may go against the, the real total greenhouse gas emissions that are linked to that vehicle. How do we get over that? Or is that how, do, how, how would we sell that to make sure that we're doing it in an appropriate way? Right. So this all comes down to the, the policy that. Do they, what kind of markets um, or the, the transport configuration do they see in the future in their net zero um, ambition? So do they see more towards like autonomous vehicles and EVs or more towards like public transport and um, you know, bicycles and so on? So it comes down to each country and what vision they want for their net zero. Um, what I presented over here is for actually um, a net zero scenario that's rapid and also like um, that transitions 
from personal vehicle ownership um, in the 2040s to like public vehicles in the 2050s. That's the um, FES scenario over here. So yes, I agree with you that uh, there requires to be a large number of um, vehicle transit um, turnover in order to transition to EV. But at the same time, this is um, what the scope of my study is not to so much to determine the direction, mm -hmm. but is to enable if we are choosing this direction to how do we actually come up with policies in the correct timeline to make it um, uh, more seamless. Thank you. Questions from our audience? Do you want another advert for the energy MAC course? Um, yes. So, Z, in terms of uh, in terms of this your presentation, but in terms of the course, what parts of the course, or, or did you feel the course prepared you now for your course, your position within Aurora? Right. Again, I'm obligated to say that I'm not not being paid for this. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean the course is actually quite um, extensive. It covers like a a whole bunch of different things um, within a year. So even though what I'm doing right now, which is modeling, I mean, our energy research is actually covered in an hour by Dr. Akapo in our class. I find that actually it's actually enough for me to understand and to give me a lead into uh, my position. So for example, we are actually given a lot of materials and a lot of different like uh, um, resources if you ever want to, to actually further our, our direction if uh, we need. So Dr. Akapo actually like provided us with uh, links and uh, different like uh, materials that I can actually study before my interview so that I can be more informed when coming to my position. So yeah, we covered a lot of different things and a different um, something that to take away is actually the real world nature of our problems in our assignments and projects, right? So I feel like, what I'm doing right now, a lot of it, uh, like my consultant friends or colleagues are doing right now is actually very similar to the assignments that I have done um, in the um, uh, MSc course. So yeah, it does prepare you for like a, a real world um, um, application of like the energy systems. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Z. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Z. So yeah, so this is the first of the seminars where we have showcased some of the work that's been done by our students within the MSc in their dissertations. And I would hope it, it's not going to be the last. I think we're going to try and do this on a, on a more regular basis. As uh, Z and, and Aflam were, of course, from the cohorts before those that graduated this summer. It's that we'll, we'll be able to come and, give, and present on topics they've done. Um, so, but just thank you very much. And uh, yep, then I'm going to hand back over to Rolly. I look forward to inviting you back, David, with some yeah. more brilliant projects. And yeah. just a quick note, uh, next week we'll be hearing from Harish Bhaskaran based in uh, material science, nearly got it wrong, and he's looking at materials and how they help with improvement of energy efficiency, and that's coming from smart windows to computing devices. So I hope you can join us next week, and thanks very much for today. Thanks again. Thank you.